All right, everyone, and good afternoon and welcome to today's System Level Effects on Solder Joint Reliability webinar. My name is Mark Musitano. I am a senior sales engineer over here at DFR Solutions, and I will be running today's webinar. With me on the line today is Maxim Serbreni. He is a technical fellow over here at DFR Solutions, and he is an integral part of our Sherlock development team. Well, thank you, Mark, for uh, the introduction. A uh, quick uh, note about myself. I'm a research engineer at DFR Solutions, and I'm part of the R&D team responsible for developing the physics of failure models for our predictive software, Sherlock. And here we're going to present some of the capability and the research behind what, we're, what we have been doing. Okay. So... Today, we're quickly going to talk about system level effects affecting solder joint reliability. And we define those system level effects to be the influence of your printed circuit board, the effect of any potting, conformal coating, the effect of component configuration in the board, and an example of it would be used the effect of mirroring, which will then flow into the influence of mounting points and the housing on your PCB, which actually have a very similar interaction. And then we're going to briefly inter talk about physics of failure methodologies behind the predictive methodology we use. And then we're just quickly going to give you a note on solder alloy selection approach or methodology. And then we're going to leave you off with recommendations and tools to which you can proceed following this presentation. Now, to satisfy the curiosity of some of you, I have a Russian accent. I'm originally from, from the Ukraine, okay? So to those that are not uh, familiar with solder fatigue in electronic assemblies and packages, here we're gonna discuss primarily thermomechanical fatigue of solder in interconnects. Unlike vibration-induced fatigue in electronic packages or in solder, thermomechanical fatigue is mainly characterized as low cycle fatigue mechanism and the vibration induced uh, fatigue is usually our high cycle fatigue so they both do interact with each other but in critical high reliability applications that we are concerned with usually thermomechanical fatigue dominates failure rates in electronic packaging so what 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 is actually happening you have solder joints uh, in various types of electronic packages and different soldering me methods that result in different solder joint geometries. Now, though that geometry will eventually dictate the, the distribution of loads in the solder joints due to the external extrin extrinsic fatigue parameters such as your environmental conditions or, for example, in power electronics, you have internal heating. What that will happen, it will increase or decrease the temperatures subjected. So that fluctuation in temperature will result in different differential expansion across your packages, which essentially pulls or contracts the solder joints in a cyclic manner, inducing fatigue. So as you can see, the temperature fluctuations in this graph can be uh, different with different amplitudes, different uh, temperatures, which essentially induce a different stress state on your solder joints, uh, causing them to fail from a fatigue or a wear out mechanism. Now, here is an example to illustrate what is actually happening to solder joints during thermal expansion in any bottom terminated package. Here specifically, we're going to show ball grid array components. Ideally, what we are expecting the, or visualizing on the top side is just the differential expansion without any bending. So it's in plane, perfect expansion. In reality, it uh, never follows that idealized uh, behavior in which we like to use by the equation above in which the shear strain is directly proportional to the solder height, the solder joint length, temperature change, and coefficient of thermal expansion mismatch. In reality, you have, as you can see in the picture on the bottom, you have localized or package level or board level warpage. 
Now, to some extent, that warp warpage is beneficial in bottom terminate component, and it's beneficial in a way that it reduces the effective shear strain on the component or on the most peripheral solder joint defined by greatest distance to neutral point. Now, that warpage will minimize the shear strain uh, range subjected to the solder, and that in turn will increase the effective cycles to failure your solder joint will observe. Now, obviously, in some conditions, depending on your mounting and potting, in which we're going to discuss in this uh, presentation, excessive warpage will reduce your fatigue life. Now, when you are experiencing excessive warpage, it's primarily due to the system level effects that we're going to be addressing during this talk today. So without further ado, we're going to start with explaining the mechanics, the shear and axial loading deformation in the microelectronics component. Now, because bulk grid array packages with underfill are so critical in any electronic assembly in which they are used, we need to understand why we're seeing accelerated failures in bulk grid array packages. The issue is that the underfill, as you can see in this illustration, is not constrained on the side. It's only constrained between the top package and the bottom PCB from expanding. So that's the only direction in which axial loads can generate in electro well in underfill bulk grid array packages. Now we we are going to show you why we actually care about that axial loading. Essentially, the benefits of the underfill that it reduces the shear strain by constricting the thermal expansion mismatch between the uh, component, the package, and the board. But when you have that axial contribution, you will have uh, accelerated failures. And that's what we are here to essentially emphasize in the first couple of slides. Now, many bulk experiments on uh, solder fatigue, bulk solder per se, I should say, have been performed. And they did illustrate the effect of ratcheting strain accumulation due to non-proportional mean stress in solder joints. And that is a very similar condition, or this is at least a control ex controlled example of an idealized case that solder joints experience. This particular experiment in which we illustrate here that was done by Liang about torsional fatigue with axial load. Essentially, they did a cyclic torsional experiment with a constant mean axial stress, which is essentially very similar to the axial stress that you will experience from some, some underfills. So you can see that when the underfill properties, the CT and the modulus of the underfill match or are they do not match, but they match the overall package properties, they can induce that mean axial stress. And you can see how sensitive the fatigue life of solder interconnects to that uh, increase in mean stress magnitude. And that mainly due to the sensitivity of fatigue crack growth process to the modality of the applied load. Now, that in turn, that shear and axial fatigue loading uh, translate into our electronic packages in the form of the underfill. So this is an example, a very good example of a paper in which it clearly illustrates the effect of that axial effect. In addition to that axial effect, because we are working with polymers, which show glass transition uh, temperature, we have another factor of the glass transition temperature. Now, the glass transition temperature essentially will dictate when that axial loading is happening in your electronic package in a specific temperature profile and the magnitude of that expansion you are looking at, which we'll later show you. We can actually uh, quantify using finite element modeling. In this slide, briefly want to illustrate the glass transition temperature of the two types of underfill on the package they tested in a full, in a full underfill and corner staking had 69 and 85 Celsius, well within the minus 40 to 125 Celsius uh, temperature, IPC standardized temperature profile in which they used. You can see that the fatigue life on the bottom right table illustrates that in all cases of the underfill, they resulted in lower fatigue life than the control, the not underfill. So in this case, it is counterintuitive to use an underfill which actually 
degrades your thermomechanical fatigue life. And the main reason is, as we showed earlier, you have that uh, contribution of that axial stress or strain component, the axial loading of that solder joint in addition to the shear loading. So that's something we're going to attack in, in the next slides in further detail. Now, the first system level effect we're going to address here is the effect of the glass tile on solder fatigue. Glass tile essentially is the weave of the glass fiber in your FR4, in your fiberglass composite board. So the influence of the glass tile comes in the way of the density of the fiber and the, and the layer count. And depending on your board design, so if you have a 63 mil or a 93 mil board and you have eight layers versus 16 layers, the volume ratio of the fiberglass and epoxy resin in which it is uh, the matrix in your PCBs will change. And that in turn will dictate on the final coefficient of thermal expansion and elastic modules of your PCB in, with respect to the warp and fill direction. So the X, Y in plane and the Z direction of your PCB. Now, why the coefficient of thermal expansion and the elastic modulus properties of your PCB are so critical to your solder fatigue because the effective shear strain subjected on the solder joint is mainly driven by the coefficient of thermal expansion mismatch between your package and your PCB. As you can see, this is a quick illustration of what um, the laminate calculators in Sherlock can do. So we right now have the knowledge and the ability to predict and calculate your specific coefficient of thermal expansion and modulus of the PCB you use. So essentially, it is a function of uh, how many layers you have, your glass style, your board design as far as where your copper layers are at, how many there are, and the thickness of the board, and the volume fraction of resin to glasses. You can see that anywhere from the 1080 to the 7628, uh, glass tiles will have different coefficient of thermal expansion and modulus. And you can see that using different glass tiles in thermomechanical fatigue uh, uh, calculation or prediction will result in an order of magnitude uh, fatigue life uh, prediction. This is mainly due to increasing or decreasing the CTE mass match between the component and the PCB which derives that shear strain range the solder is experiencing uh, through the cyclic life of the, of the joint and essentially dominates the, drives the crack propagation through it. So when you are doing any type of system level consideration, the printed circuit board, the PCB properties, as far as its glass tiles should be taken into consideration. So after mentioning Quickly, the glass style influence, we're now going to talk about kind of the bulk of this uh, presentation, which addresses effects of improper conformal coatings. Now, for this, this, uh, this is an experiment that was done in conjunction with Rockwell Collins and was recently published in semi-term 2017, and we're going to further publish additional data that is not presented here in subsequent journal publications. But here is a very common experiment in which we applied standard conformal coating using a spray application in which we did not allow the, the acrylic conformal coating to wick underneath the BGA package. Now, we simulated deep coating application by means of thick coating, as we refer to it, by using a pneumatic syringe to manually apply the acrylic conformal coating underneath each BGA. This will mimic the effect of a very strong capillary action flow of acrylic underneath the components from certain deep coating applications. And in this case, we're just going to talk about acrylic conformal coating influence on solder fatigue during thermal cycling. We did test five other uh, conformal coating materials, including silicone, uh, polyurethanes, and epoxies in conjunction with acrylic, but we only have some time, very limited time, so we're just going to address the acrylic. Now, we did 
decide to use two temperature cycles, a standardized IPC minus 55 to 125 temperature cycle and a less aggressive temperature cycle of minus 20 to 80 to see if there is any dependence on the temperature profile. So what we initially approached this uh, study from a numerical perspective by modeling the mechanical behavior of solder joints due to that uh, thick underfill coating uh, application. Now, in here, we're just going to show you the results of the conformal, the thick conformal coating, because uh, at the end, we'll illustrate, show you the actual experimental results, and you don't, we did not really see any difference between standard coating and the control uh, component. So there wasn't really any benefits or adverse effects using the acrylic spray coating application, as long as you don't let it weak underneath the package. And here we are just going to address now. Granted, please take into effect that this type of simulations is very sensitive to the methodology in which you use. In this case, we did not tie the conformal coating to the solder joints for various reasons that we can address uh, answer in questions after this, this presentation. But the most important aspect of this presentation is accurate material uh, property characterization. And here you can see on the bottom right figure the modulus and coefficient of thermal expansion uh, with as a function of temperature for that acrylic conformal coating we used. And we characterized it using dynamic mechanical analysis and thermal mechanical analysis. We determined the glass transition to be around 15 degrees Celsius. And that all is fed uh, into the finite element uh, model along with um, along with partitioning the creep and plasticity influences of the solder itself and addressing all the other materials, such as the dye, the mold compound, the FR4, the substrate as linear elastic materials, since they don't really see any plastic deformation, except the solder and possibly the copper pads. And so here is the initial results of the modeling. And what you're looking at is a quarter symmetric model, top view of a quarter symmetric model and on the top side, BGA, it's the ball underneath the dye shadow, and the bottom one illustrates the ball at the package corner with largest distance to neutral effect. You clearly see that the underneath the dye package, you see a more uniform distribution, which accounts to a more axially driven uh, stress state, and the package shows that classical shear, cyclic shear behavior due to the large distance to neutral point effect. And this is an example to illustrate for SAC-305 solder. Now, we did perform this experiment for uh, 6337 thin lead solder alloy, which we're going to show you cross-section in about uh, two minutes. So this, now, this is a very important slide to illustrate. Now, what you're looking at is the one misi stress distribution. So one misi is just equivalent stress, has no magnitude associated with it. Uh, and you're seeing in A and B are the stress states at 125, see at the beginning of the dwell at each temperature extreme. For the left side, you have the more aggressive temperature cycle, 125 to minus 55. On the right, the less severe temperature cycle, 80 to minus 20. And you see that they are almost the same in magnitude. And the issue, well, the reason behind it is the fact that this is simulation that was done for the thick conformal coating, if you remember. So the expansion and contraction of that acrylic actually dominates the stress state in the solder. So it doesn't really matter that it was reaching 80C or 125C because the expansion was pretty much uniform past the glass transition temperature of 15 Celsius. And likewise, on the cold dwell temperature of minus 20 and minus 55, which are both below the glass transition, the contraction was very similar. So they both reached sort of an equivalent uh, stress state in both temperature cycles, and you can see the results later on. We're going to talk about them. Now, this is a quick illustration of what the thin lead uh, solder properties look in the same model. And you can see that the thin lead actually shows a much more aggressive uh, shear behavior. So unlike the unlike the SAC 305, which is much stiffer at colder temperatures and can absorb uh, larger stresses, the thin lead solder 
is softer and more compliant, so it can absorb more plastic deformation and shear and decompress at the same time. Now, this is just a graphical illustration of the stress state. In the next slide, we are going to talk about the actual quantification of the, stre of the strain value, because essentially we have stress relaxation and creep, so we wanted to just illustrate the strain state because due to thermomechanical expansion of the package in the acrylic, the loading mode is displacement control, so it's strain control under the solder. And um, we do see a compressive ratcheting effect. So what happens with the thick acrylic conformal coating around that glass transition temperature, if you can see on the bottom left figure, you can see a slight dip uh, at the beginning and end of the cold te temperature. And what you are looking at is the uh, is a graph without coating, with coating, as a function of temperature. So you see that with coating, with a thick coating, you can see the dip. And what the dip does, it carries a compressive mean strain state to the subsequent ther thermal cycle. And that is more evident when you're actually plotting the axial strain component as a function of time or temperature in which you can see clearly that the axial strain, well, the compressive axial strain is much higher than the, uh, than the peak one. Well, it will become higher. So essentially, it starts off uh, higher in, ax in tension and smaller in compression, but then you have this compressive drift with the thick conformal coating. And to illustrate that, uh, that behavior more accurately, we performed cross-sectional analysis to kind of justify our uh, finite element modeling results, the simulations results. And you clearly see that the, this is thin lead uh, BGAs. On the left, you can see standard uh, component without any conformal coating applied to it. You can see cracks or propagate throughout the in bottom or lower interface without significant plastic deformation on the package. Now, the middle and right pictures are results of the thick conformal coating. And what you can see is that after 1600 cycles, after enough cycles, that drift in mean compressive axial strain state squishes out the solder and then deforms it. It deforms it enough for cracks to slowly propagate on it. Now, in the rightmost picture, you can see the picture on the bottom shows a cross section of the same row in which the uh, farthest balls from the center, so the joints with the largest distance to neutral point effect actually saw most of the damage and some of the joints in the middle of the package hardly experienced any damage. That was not really the case for thin lead solder joints. So the thin lead solder joints actually showed uh, to some extent less plastic deformation, even though it is still extreme. You can see that the control one actually cracked on the bottom of the pad, and this is mainly due to the joint geometry and warping of the package and board assembly. But here you can see that the thin lead did not really show any distance to neutral point effect, and it showed still significant plastic deformation. The reason it did not last as long as the thin lead is because it's not as compliant as the thin lead solder at cold temperature. So at the cold temperature, the factory five lead free solder much more stiffer, transfers more load due to that contraction of the acrylic uh, conformal coating, which is able to warp the package and apply larger compressive stresses. Now, here you can see cycles to failure for the factory five and thin lead that we analyzed using a two-parameter viable uh, plot. And you can see that the mean life of thin lead was actually higher than factory of five for almost all conditions except for the standard uh, control, um, in, I apologize, for the standard and control groups for the second temperature cycle. Now, this is kind of surprising because usually they tell us that factory of five is more reliable than thin lead solder joints. However, in this case, is the mechanics of the solder joint and package interaction with the conformal coating that wicks underneath really influences the thermomechanical fatigue life. And you can see that the standard, uh, I mean, the thick conformal coating reduces fatigue life by an order of magnitude 
and it just becomes more pronounced with the increase in the temperature cycling range. So this is a very good point to illustrate. So now we're going to transition. We talked about the effect of glass tile and PCB, axial and shear loads. We talked about uh, effect of uh, improper conformal coating. So now we're going to add another system level effect in the form of mirroring. So this is, we're going to talk about physical mechanical constraining of solder joints to print in, printed circuit boards. So you can see here an example of a study that was made uh, by May Funas back in 2003 in which they uh, did thermomechanical cycling on mirrored wall grid array packages. Now they, you can see on the left table Clearly, you have a 2 to 3x decrease in fatigue life compared to single-sided components. And why is that? Why are they experiencing that lower fatigue life? So to answer that, again, we resort, we resort to finite element simulations. And here we clearly illustrate that the warping of a single-sided component significantly contributes to the accumulation of damage in the form of that mirroring over constrains your package. It over constrains the package and board deflection, which transmits higher axial loads to the solder joint. So essentially, the load sharing between the package and the board is now being absorbed more by the solder joint than for a single sided package. And we can see that the deflection under cold dwell actually contributes possibly to more damage than the hot temperature dwell. This is mainly because the solder is sled free solder, I apologize, is more stiff at low temperatures, so the contraction of the entire assembly warps it really aggressively, causing accumulation of more uh, damage. Here we can clearly see that the strain energy density and uh, maximum principal strains for the single sided and mirror configuration. So by the end of the third temperature cycle, the strain energy density accumulation for that third temperature cycle was 2x larger than the single sided component. So that indicates essentially uh, almost an exponential increase in, well, decrease, I apologize, in fatigue life compared to the single sided component. And the reason why we illustrate the third thermal cycle, that's usually when you see enough uh, damage stabilization from creep strain accumulation during temperature cycling in, at which you can comfortably extract your damage parameters for fatigue life predictions from finite elements. So now we're going to be a more generalized uh, influence of board mounting and housing. So this is very similar to what you saw with the mirrored packages in which you have over constraining which generates large board strains that are being shared by the solder. Now on the left side, you can see a configuration in which the mount points were placed very close to the uh, test components, BGAs in this example that were generated using Sherlock uh, automated design analysis tool. So this tool allows us to easily uh, illustrate the the effect of those system level factors such as mounting and mirroring on fatigue life of components and assemblies. And you can see that by placing more, uh, more mount points farther from the package in the peripheral of your board, you can increase your natural frequency. Now, this is an image of board uh, deflection and not board strains. If we were to show you the board strains, in this case, you would see higher strains at the configuration in which the mounting points are closer to the package. So that will actually cause them the peripheral components because they're so close to the mounting to fail first because of that strain concentration, which we can predict using Sherlock. Now on the right side, what's important to illustrate, this is, was, this is an image of a finite element model done a couple of years ago at DFR Solutions in which they showed the interaction of the board potting and housing on a QFM component. So what happens is when you over constrain, you constrict your potting compounds from expanding those soft polymers, they will then have to 
uh, interact and brace themselves against the board since the housing is not non-compliant, it's very stiff metal, the weakest link would be the PCBs and components. So you can see that there is an order of magnitude increase in the uh, solder joint strains because of the warping that the parking causes not just on the board itself, but to the comp individual component as well. So now we're going to transition from our uh, system level effects to physics of failure methodology and why it is critical in uh, predicting solder joint fatigue from system level effects. Now, the accuracy of any type of simulation, either using finite element or physics of failure in which you use a combination of analytical equations and empirical uh, models, you are only as accurate as your constitutive model. So defining the right material properties with the right solder alloy properties are critical in understanding what's actually going, going on in, in those solder joints to be able to then quantify a characteristic life that you would uh, later on validate with experimental results. So besides material properties, you need to have the empirical aspect to be able to deterministically associate the mechanics in solder joints to cycles to failure. And that is mainly driven by how accurately are you matching, are you predicting the failure mechanism or mode in your solder interconnect. So it could be thermomechanical fatigue cracking, so crack driven, fatigue crack driven, could be uh, drop impact, could be vibration, so it could it could shift from low cycle fatigue to high cycle fatigue depend on your environmental conditions or operating conditions. Now, physics of failure approach that we specifically integrate into Sherlock allows us to uh, account for all those extrinsic and intrinsic parameters. So we're talking about intrinsic parameters such as the solder alloy properties and extrinsic factors such as the geometry of the components and the assembly and your operating conditions. So the, we incorporate all of them together into a physics of failure approach that also includes analytical equation in a combination of analytical equations and numerical simulations to better assess our uh, physics, our predictive methodology. Now here is a quick example of what, how, what we, how do we apply physics of failure. Now obviously when you talk about physics of failure and predicting fatigue life of solder interconnect, there are many, many equations involved. We're not going to cover any equations here, but we do publish all of our methods and models in conference and journal publications, as well as some are available on our website. Quick approach of how you tackle a QFN uh, package reliability. Now, this has already been integrated into Sherlock, so uh, if you would like to assess the reliability of QFN packages, for example, as well as any other type of electronic package, we address it by partitioning the geo geometric dependency with material properties. Now, the effect of glass transition temperature of mold compounds nowadays with the transition to green mold compounds is very critical. So, understanding the CTE and modulus properties dependence with the temperature and glass transition is very important because thermomechanical fatigue is the interaction of thermal and mechanical properties together as a function of temperature. And from that we can extract the, depend, the dependency of those material properties on the load condition on the solder. We then apply the constitutive properties for the specific solder alloy we are simulating. We then can feed our damage parameter calculated from those constitutive behavior and load state to uh, damage parameters to better predict our uh, cycles to failure and account for those. Again, intrinsic and extrinsic factors affecting solder joint reliability. And we do that, for example, in a QFN, we will have to partition the geometry into effective areas and then we we'll use composite uh, structure theory to calculate an effective property so effective coefficient of thermal expansion and modulus that are temperature dependent for your package size dimensions and for your envir environment, environmental use conditions. So besides physics of failure approach, 
solder alloy selection is another critical component in system level reliability of solder interconnects. Now, to those who are not familiar, solder alloy is basically tin based. So the element tin is a tetragonal body center crystal structure, which is allotropic. It, it is highly anise, well, it is some, some, somewhat anisotropic compared to other alloys. And here is a picture on the top right uh, that was made by Beeler over at SUNY Binghamton in which he characterized the coefficient of thermal expansion and modulus of solder alloy itself with respect to crystal structure. So this is to illustrate the importance of uh, morphology, grain morphology of solder interconnects. Now, solder interconnects have in microelectronic components that we deal with these days have very small, fine number of grains. The smaller the solder joint, the more dependent its mechanical behavior on grain morphology becomes. And this is a figure specifically that illustrates the dependency of grain morphology on loading orientation. So you can see we took two solder joints in which we cycle them in pure axial during thermomechanical loading, and you can see that the joint on the left failed via a diagonal crack propagation, and the joint on the right failed with the crack propagating perpendicular to the axially applied load. Now, we know that for a fact that the geometry was relatively consistent between our other joints that we tested, and some of them will decide to fail in a different crack uh, propagation orientation. So this is, we know that this is directly proportional to the degree of grain morphology involvement in the fatigue life process. So this is still something you should take into consideration, but we still do not have direct control over how we reflow our uh, solder joints with respect to a desirable grain morphology. We're not there yet, but maybe in the next 20 years will reach a level in which we can optimize our grain morphology for the loading orientation to increase fatigue life of solder interconnects. Maybe. So here we're going to continue the solder alloy selection approach. So as far as your test with selecting a type of lead-free solder alloy for, for your system. Now, we know clearly that SAC-305 compared to SAC-105, so the different silver content in our lead-free solder alloy will influence its fatigue under ter temperature cycling or drop. So you have different type of failure modes that are interacting. And the issue is that, well, the reason why SAC-305 is better than SAC-105 is due to the type and formation of thin silver intermetallic distribution in the in the solder joint itself. So more uh, thin copper uh, intermetallics would uh, act as, well, they act as you have increased uh, barriers to fatigue crack growth during temperature cycling, but because the drop impact has very, uh, it's, fast, abrupt loading in which you have absolutely no creep deformation, the, those uh, large intermetallics actually are very brittle and they just break and do not offer any resistance to crack propagation. So it clearly shows that the less intermetallics in SAC 105 are more reliable under the type of loading condition. So you always have to consider what you need to take from the slide is that you need to optimize your solder joint selection based on the global loading condition and environmental, uh, well, your use environment, which will dictate the failure mechanism you're going to observe. So if you're designing for fatigue, for thermomechanical fatigue, great. SAC 305, SAC 405 will work uh, great if you're designing for a, a high cycle fatigue vibration, go with a low silver alloy and you are also quite limited by the type of alloys depending on your um, assembly process, either wave soldering, uh, reflow, or uh, BGAs. So this is what I, I wanted you to take from this last slide. Now, what you can do as manufacturers, engineers, 
electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, FEA simulators. If you do not currently have Sherlock, you can go on our website. We offer extensive free resources to predict, to assess the damage and of your, well, the reliability assessment of your solder interconnects in addition to other failure mechanisms such as uh, capacitor flex, cracking, plated through hole fatigue in the copper, component vibration. Now, those are free calculators available to you online on our website. They are sort of rudimentary compared to the calculate, to, compared to the ability to the models we integrated into Sherlock. So, this offers a great starting point for you to be able to approach and tackle the system level uh, reliability factors of solder interconnects. Now, this is to briefly summarize what we've been talking to you about in the last 40 minutes. The thermomechanical fatigue largely depends on your component configuration and material properties, which eventually will then dictate the loading condition and drive the mechanism, the failure mechanism in solder joints. Now, PCB selection, glass style, very critical to your final coefficient of thermal expansion and modulus properties, which will dictate the fatigue life of your solder. So whenever you are designing, selecting a PCB, so everyone's design is a bit different and that's okay, but you do have to make sure that your final coefficient of thermal expansion and modulus will be optimal to your fatigue life performance, will desire fatigue life performance from solder joint reliability aspect as well. And as far as acrylic coatings, we did show that the negative impact of acrylic on formal coating primarily around its glass transition temperature, which can cause those excessive axial loads to build up. Now, this is a cap predictive capability that will be implemented in Sherlock by the end of the year. So this mixed mode effect is not quite there yet as far as it's, we, we integrated a qualitative met metric as far as understanding the influence of those spottings and acrylics but by the end of the year you'll be able to use a quantitative approach to fatigue life due to pottings underfills and coatings in Sherlock. Now we also briefly mentioned physics of failure implementation uh, for solder fatigue and this is uh, this was a very high level description of the methodology not necessarily the, equ the equations themselves which are all implemented in Sherlock and we publish them and are available on our website the key thing to take out of this uh, presentation, we showed you extensive simulation that did match the experimental results, which shows how powerful simulation tools can be. You always have to verify any type of simulation, whether it be for solder fatigue or other type of failure mechanisms in uh, electronic uh, components, have to verify that and validate that with experimental data. And that's pretty much all I have for you guys. Uh, thank you for your attention again. And Mark, you can take it away. All right, Maxim. Thanks for another great presentation here. Uh, so we are going to go into questions at this time. Uh, but before we do, uh, as you can see on the screen, Maxim's contact information and my contact information are both listed. So the first is, what is the modulus of the mold compound? Oh, that's a great question. So those mold compounds in QFNs, BGAs, in a lot of uh, plastic packaging are usually uh, silica-filled uh, uh, epoxies and they essentially fill them to control their coefficient of thermal expansion and increase the stiffness. So usually they range anywhere from 20 to 40 uh, gigapascals, the elastic modulus for those mold compounds. All right. Our next question here is, uh, how the heat sink load affect the solder joint for corner glue joints? Or how does, I'm, I'm guessing they meant to say. So the How does the heat the sink heat. load affect the solder fatigue for corner glue joints? Yes, so that's a good question. So as far as over-constraining, 
when you are attaching any heat sink, you need to control your spring force the, or, or essentially the, the clamping of the heat sink to the package. You can alleviate that by using some thermal interface materials by controlling the height of how much you deposit the thermal interface with the, with the clamping force to essentially minimize over constraining the expansion of the package which transmits the loads to the solder joint. So over clamping, uh, over clamping your heat sinks to any package to some extent can decrease your fatigue life by that over constrained effect that we've shown you earlier with mounting points and, B and mirrored BGAs. All right. So thank you everyone and have a great day.